But if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5 of chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 through 5. We read this last week. If it sounds familiar to you, we're going to actually finish this, this message out. Last week, if you notice in the bulletin, uh, the first point and uh, subpoints are filled in already because that's as far as we got last week. That was on purpose. That wasn't just mismanaging the time, but we're going to finish up this week and it should be a, a great time. So uh, 1 Thessalonians, beginning in verse 1, it says, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for you all, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Let's pray. Lord, we do come before you. We thank you that we can open your word. We thank you that we can take our time as we unpack these, these phrases, the, the, the meaning of, of what was written here. We know that this book was written almost, this letter was written almost 2,000 years ago to a, a body of believers that had some serious questions. They were, they were striving to serve you, but they had, they had a lot of questions of, of how to do that. And we thank you that you answered their questions, and we thank you that we can, we, can look this, we can open this book up, we can unpack it ourselves, and we can grow in our faith. We pray that you would help us to, to set aside the distractions of the day, help us to focus just for the next few moments on what your word says, and I do pray that you would send us out of here, Lord, a people who, for those who have trusted you as Savior, a people that would that just strongly desire to share that gospel. And for those who don't know you as Savior, I pray that you would open their eyes and their ears, change their heart of stone to a heart of flesh, that they would come to trust you as Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so last week we began this study through 1 Thessalonians. We only got through verses 1 and 2, uh, only got through Point one, but that's okay. We we wanna we wanna unpack and really examine what's being said. We're not just trying to buzz through as fast as possible. As we walked through the opening lines of this letter, we see three main ideas that come to the surface, and that's that's the three main points of the outline. We saw Paul's thankfulness. We talked about that in depth last week. Uh, we were going to look at the Thessalonians, the church's steadfastness. We're going to see just something about their character and the way they were striving to serve God. And then we're going, to, we're going to look at the Lord's faithfulness. And they all come together. They all connect, inter, interwoven, as it were. We unpacked Paul's thankfulness last week. It was fascinating to see a man who suffered so much for the cause of Christ, who was still thankful and still desired to serve this Christ. This is, this is profound, and, and I think we need to be very careful. We don't just gloss over that. Paul was on his way to being a well-respected, probably very wealthy, uh, uh, I almost said Philistine, but that's not the right word, a uh, Pharisee. It might, might have been both, who knows. But a uh, Pharisee, he was on his way to becoming a well-respected religious leader, a, a, a Pharisee, and when Christ changed his life, when he comes to faith and he becomes a gospel preacher, his life, I mean, we could say his life turned demonstrably for the worse. I mean, he, he was not looking forward to a life of being uh, stoned with stones and beaten with sticks and chased around. There, there's some truth to that. He was physically beat up for the cause of Christ, yet he's still thankful, yet he still desires to serve this Christ. Why? Why did, he, why did he keep going? Well, it's because he knew the Jesus. He knew who Jesus is. He knew what Jesus had promised to all those that follow him. He knew his Savior intimately, closely, and it was worth it. Today, we're going to look at the church that Paul founded. We're going to look at the Savior that Paul and the Thessalonians trusted. That's how we're going to unpack this passage today. Very quickly, we have a map on the screen. We showed this last week. That's the larger area. Down in the bottom right, you see Jerusalem and Israel. Thessalonia 
or Th- yeah, Thessalonica is uh, at the top toward the left. So you see that word Macedonia up there. If you go to the next map, it's a little it's a little bit more blown up. You see where Thessalonica is. It's right to the the east of Berea. It's west of Philippi. But this is this this is the city where this church is located. We talked about just briefly last week. It's a ca- it was the capital of Macedonia. So it was a big city. It had about a hundred thousand people, which is just a little bit bigger than Noblesville. So if you take uh, uh, Carmel here in Indiana, Carmel's got 106,000, Nobleville's got about, about 75,000. So it's, it was a city of, of approximately that size. It was located on some east-west and north-south, north-south trade routes. So a lot of people were coming and going. It was a very busy metropolis, metropolis area. Uh, you had all the major Greek and Roman deities. Emperor worship was, was there. And that's that's the backdrop for this church. Paul comes in, and we talked about this last week in depth, but Paul comes in, he preaches the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He preaches this in the synagogue for three, three Sabbaths, several Jews, some devout Gentiles who, who had, God had been working in their hearts, and many of the leading women come to Christ. That's the, that's the core of this church. Some Jewish leaders cause an uproar, and Paul had to be sent away at night, almost scramble out of the city. So he's, he's left the city, and he has this, this, this uh, desire to go back to teach these people. And then what happens is some of these Thessalonian Christians die unexpectedly. And there's this concern of, we were going we to be alive until Christ returned. Now that some people have died, what do we do? And so that's why Paul writes this letter. He deals with Christian living, but he also encourages them that believers that die before the Lord returns, they won't miss out on salvation. That's encouraging. But that's the occasion of this letter. So we jumped into three observations in this introduction. We saw the apostles' thankfulness. We'll just buzz through this really quickly because we, uh, we did treat this in depth last week. We saw that Paul's thankfulness, he says... Uh, he says, we give thanks to God always for all of you constantly mentioning you in our prayers. So it's directed toward God. His, his thankfulness is Godward. He's, I'm sure he appreciates the people, but his thankfulness is toward God. He thanks God for the gifts. And it's continuous in nature. He continues to thank God. And again, with, when you think of Paul, who toward the end of his life, he's probably a beaten up wreck. He's probably a shell of the man he once was. He was probably, it probably hurt to walk. It probably hurt to get out of bed. Yet he was still thankful because he knew reality. He knew that this momentary discomfort was nothing in light of eternity. He knew what was real and he thanked God and he continued to thank God. Now Paul's thankfulness is to God, but it's for this church. And it's for this church's steadfastness. This is where we'll jump in today. Verse 3 talks about the Thessalonians' steadfastness. He says, we, con- we mention you constantly in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's interesting. Uh, church plants ha- are always difficult. If you've ever been around a church plant, they're, they're, they're difficult. It's hard. It's hard to get started. Uh, we probably all heard the story about the church plant that just took off immediately and it was easy peasy, but that's not the way normal church plants are, and it's definitely not the way it was in Paul's day. It's hard to tell if a church plant is, is founded on the gospel or on some big personality. One of, the, one of those challenges of, of having a, a pastor or a minister with a big personality. Are people here for the gospel or are the people here for him? Right? That, that's an ongoing challenge. And, and especially with a church plant. And especially in the time before the written word of God was finished. So Paul plants these churches. He preaches, but he doesn't have a finished Bible to give them or even to read from. They have the Old Testament, which was finished. But Paul is the one who's writing half the New Testament. When Thessalonians was written, there wasn't really any. There, there may have been Galatians and James out there. But we're not even sure if they would have been widely circulated yet. So this is hard. This is a challenge. 
Paul even had to leave before he felt that he'd taught them all they needed. So when he heard that they were continuing in sound doctrine and faithfully growing, it encouraged him. He's, he's, he's encouraged by this. These people, are they haven't, they haven't fallen off the rails yet. That's a good thing. Because as, as we talked about the seven churches from Revelation a few months ago, half of those churches, most of those churches, five out of the seven, had gone off the rails. They were, they were struggling in different areas. So Paul's encouraged by these guys. And one of the things that Paul's encouraged by is he sees that their actions grow from their faith in Christ. Their actions grow from their faith in Christ. It's generally true. I would almost say it's always true that we act on what we believe. We we do what we believe. Now, sometimes we say we believe something and we, we don't really believe it. We do something differently. But generally, we do what we believe. If I believe the chair will hold me, I will sit in it. If I do not believe the chair will hold me, I will not sit in it. You can tell what I believe by whether or not I sit in the chair, if that makes sense. And that's just one a little example, but we act generally on what we believe. The Thessalonians believed in Christ. They are confident in the gospel, and their actions display it. He talks about this. He says, we, uh, we remember before our God and Father your work of faith. And that could probably be translated, your work produced by faith. The actions that proceed out of your faith. The word work here literally means an occupation or an undertaking. It's the thing someone does. And he says, the things you do are produced by your faith. You you act on what you believe. We see this written about in James chapter 2. James got a, got a kind of a lengthy section of James chapter 2, but, but hopefully you appreciate it. Uh, James 2, beginning in verse 14, James says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Now, that verse has been a struggle for many believers for, for a couple millennia. There was actually some struggle very early on whether this is Scripture because some people thought that James was teaching a, salva- a works-based salvation. It's not what he's doing here. As we read down, you'll see he's talking about a faith that actually does something. Pe- many people were saying, I believe, but not doing anything. What James says, brother, if, if you, brothers, if, if someone says he has faith, says he has faith, but doesn't do anything, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving him the things needed for the body, what good is that? That's a great question. It's, it hits close to home. You know, when somebody comes to you and says, hey, I've got this thing going on in my life, and you say, I'll be praying for you. When? Now, sometimes there's nothing else we can do, and prayer is a powerful thing. But, like, hey, you know, winter's coming, and my kids don't have coats, and you have a closet full of coats. I'll pray for you. How about you give them some coats, right? Uh, hey, my, my family has lost 25 pounds, not on purpose, because we're, we, we can't afford food. And you've got a pantry full of food. I'll pray for you. That's what he's talking about here. That's not a picture of saving faith. So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But somebody will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. That's another another terrifying uh, uh, passage there. I believe in God. Have you ever tried to share the gospel with somebody and they say, I believe in God? Well, so is Satan. That's not great company. Let's, let's, move, let's move beyond that. Do you want to be shown, oh fool, you foolish person, that, apart, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. As he was a, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, 
was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. And again, a challenging passage, but what James is talking about is an active faith. If you believe, if you've put your faith in Christ, if you believe Christ is who he says he is, if you believe the Bible is what it claims to be, you're going to act on it. James isn't teaching salvation by works, rather that our faith is identified by our actions. Our works reveal our beliefs. So the question to ask Christians today, professing Christians today, are you living like Christ is king? We would all proclaim that. We would all say Christ is king. Are you living like Christ is king? Or are you living like cash is king? Or whatever this world offers is king? Are you living like eternity is real? Or are you living like just the right now is real? Are we acting on what we say we believe? It is, it is encouraging to me that <clears throat> James mentions Abraham's faith. Abraham is referred to this man, as this man of faith. He's a man of God. He's a friend of God. He's this man of faith. But if you know anything about Abraham's life, Abraham is able to trust God you know, this whole example of him offering Isaac. And this was not a test for God. God did not need to test Abraham to see if Abraham was willing to give Isaac up. It was a test for Abraham. Was Abraham willing to trust God enough to give Isaac up? And God doesn't, doesn't allow him to sacrifice Isaac. But we look at this, imp- this incredible act of faith that he's, going to, he's willing to give up his son. But this faith is a learned faith. And he learned it from failure because about 10 years earlier, actually longer, than, longer ago than that, God promised Abraham. Oh, Abraham was this aging man. He's, he's relatively wealthy. He's been given these promises by God, but he has no biological son. He has no, he has no heir. And God says, I'm going to give you an heir. And 10 years go by and he doesn't have a baby with his wife, Sarah. And so Abraham loses faith and decides to do it his own way. They get Hagar. And this was an ex- a, this, it was an acceptable thing within the culture that if a woman couldn't have children, you'd have a female slave come in, become a concubine. She would have a child in, in place. And that first child would be considered the heir. They decide to do this on their own. They have this baby. It, it backfires horribly. It blows up in their face. And Abraham, through that failure, learns to trust God. I think that's a beautiful thing for us to understand. God calls us to faith. He calls us to trust. He gives us many reasons to trust, but God can also work with people who have failed. Aren't you glad of that? Don't you appreciate that, that God is, God is able to pick up broken pieces and use them? So he says, he, Paul talks about this work that's produced by faith. He goes on, he talks about the labor of love or this labor that's prompted by love. And this word labor is a different Greek word than the word work. This word labor means toil or exhausting work. It can also mean a beating. This, this, this Greek word could, could also refer to someone who was beaten up. You know, was a, a physically war, exhausting effort. And what this church is doing in Thessalonica, they are following Christ amid persecution. That's a hard thing to do. They're following Christ when everyone in their lives is pushing them away from Christ, trying to push them away at least. These these Thessalonians continue to follow Christ because they love their Savior. This labor, they're willing to be exhausted. They're willing to take a beating because they love their Savior. Jesus says in John chapter 14, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to the, 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 the close 12 disciples, but it applies to us today. If you love Christ, you'll keep his commandments. You will actually follow him. Sometimes we use the word Christian. Christian literally means Christ follower or little Christ. And we use that word and it's become so watered down, sometimes it doesn't mean anything. Oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But well, Jesus says, if you're actually going to, if you love me, if you really are my followers, you're going to keep my commandments. 
And remember, these, these Christians in Thessalonica, it's a mixed bag. It's, it's a group of Jews. It's a group of Gentiles. They're not all Jews, not all Gentiles. It's a mix. <clears throat> and they're both being ostracized from their communities. The Jews who have, co- who have put their faith in Christ, who recognize Christ as Messiah, they're being pushed out of the synagogue. They, they're, not, they're, they're, they're being pushed out of their community, their, their entire you know, Judaism isn't just a religion, it's an it's a ethnicity, it's a way of life. So they're getting kicked out of everything. The Gentiles who come to Christ, they're also, because they're stepping away from the false gods, so they're also being ostracized from their pagan communities. And what's challenging here is both of those communities would receive these people back if they just stopped following Christ. The Jews would bring these people back if you would just say, oh yeah, yeah, Jesus really isn't the Messiah. Yeah, sorry about that. I got confused. The pagans would accept these people back if they said, hey, you know what? Yeah, they would even allow Jesus worship. Just worship Diana and Zeus and the emperor too. But these, these people are facing this exhausting work of serving Christ. Why? Because they have this love for Christ. They know, they know their Savior and they love him. Oh, that we would have the same commitment to our Lord today. The distractions are the same. We have, we have people in our lives pulling us away from Christ, trying to pull us away from Christ. Um, you know, we may have literal people trying to pull you away, push you away, but we also have our, our entire culture, the entertainment industry, would love to draw you away from Christ mentioned before, uh, I can't remember if it was Disney or Nickelodeon, one of those kids' channels, uh, their Christmas, when, when around Christmas time, they have the fa la 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 days. They don't even talk about Christmas. They've, they've, they've erased Christ from Christmas. You can celebrate the holiday, you know, have a tree. It's a holiday tree, you know. You don't, don't put an angel on top of it. You know, don't put a star on top of it. You don't want that. But you can, you can have a holiday. Let's just forget what the holiday is about. We do have a culture that would love for us to let go of Christ. So there's this labor of love. The Thessalonians act on their faith. They act on their, their love because their hope is focused on their Lord. They have this work produced by faith, this labor prompted by love because their hope is focused on the Lord. Paul talks about endurance of hope. And again, this endurance is probably better translated, endurance inspired by hope. Endurance is patience, steadfastness. The word hope, the the, the Greek word behind hope, literally means an expectation. They have an expectation. That word hope could be both good and bad. You could expect something good. You could expect something bad. It depends on the context that it's being used in. But the word means an expectation. I, there's something coming. I'm expecting something. And so they had this hope in Christ. The church had an expectation that Christ would come for them. Well, why? Why does the church have an expectation of Christ coming? Because that's what Christ said. He promised he would come for them. Paul taught them that Christ was going to come for them. There's this, you know, Christ in, with his own word says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again to bring you unto myself. So there was an expectation. It was a rightful expectation they have. Now, most of them thought that Jesus would return in their lifetime. That's, that's something that, uh, you know, that that first century church had to struggle with because they were expecting, even the apostles, when Jesus meets them in Galilee and he, he gives them the great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel, and then he ascends into heaven. The book of Acts starts out, that's the end of the book of Matthew. The book of Acts starts out, and the angel comes down and says, hey, what are you guys doing? It seems like they just camped out on this mountaintop thinking that Jesus is going to come back in 20 minutes. He's just going to go change his clothes. You know, he has to go find his keys or something. You know, we've done that where, you know, we get home, and I just got to run in and get something, and we're we're going to get right back on the road. So they think Jesus is going to come right back, and he tarries. Now, you should be able to get that because he... He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's going to take a little time. That's not a 20-minute project. So they, they think he's coming, and 
And when they start to physically die, Paul has to write the letter to clear things up. You know, that, that was, that's what happens. But they believed God's promises. They experienced the joy of salvation. As they put their faith in Christ, there's a joy, there's a release of, 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 of you know, there's this release of joy as they're saved. They receive the sealing of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And now they're waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. God had fulfilled many promises. This is one of the challenges I think we have, is we look at some of the promises that God hasn't fulfilled yet. Jesus hasn't returned yet. And there are many people, even Paul talk, or Peter talks about it, you know, we're, we're skeptics. Well, he's not coming, right? I mean, you've been waiting for 2,000 years. He's not coming. But he promised to come. And if we look back in Scripture, one of the reasons why Scripture is written to us is so we can see the promises that God did fulfill. He made this promise, and he fulfilled it. He made this promise, he fulfilled it. So what do we do with the ones he hasn't fulfilled yet? We trust. He has a perfect track record. So we can trust him. So now they're waiting for the return of Jesus. They have this hope, and it's focused on their Lord. Paul talks uh, to Titus about this topic. He says in Titus chapter 2, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Paul talks about these, he walks through this path. He, he, he talks about salvation. You've, you've been saved. Now you're being sanctified. You're growing in your faith, and you need to be looking forward to the appearing of Christ. It will come. If Christ doesn't return in your lifetime, you'll go to him. We've, we've had a few funerals here over the years of, of wonderful, godly men and women that they're with their Savior now. Those of us who are alive, we wait for the coming of the Christ. If we, if we physically die, we go to him. But there's this expectation of meeting Christ. Peter says the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 1. He said, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. So salvation. Through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Kept in heaven for you. It's promised. That door with your name on it. If you put your faith in Christ, there's a door with your name on it in God's house. And it's not going anywhere. The name on the door isn't going to get scraped off. It's not going to fall apart. The door's not going to get, you know, moldy, and the hinges aren't going to get rusty. It's this, this inheritance is protected, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ. So we, we go through this life of difficulty. And whether we are persecuted or not, this is a life of difficulty. This is a life of aches and pains. I often joke, you know, as I, I'm 48. And so every day there's a new ache and pain. And, you know, the, my back hurts today or my knee hurts or, oh, this is the way life is going to be. My elbow pops when I make that, when I move it that way. You know, this is a world that hurts. And we have to face, we have to go through this, but eventually we're going to see our Savior. The, the, the Thessalonians, their focus, their hope was focused on their Lord. The successful Christian life must be lived with the focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Our sin is too pervasive. If we think that we can live the Christian life without focusing on Christ, we're lying to ourselves. We're wrong. You cannot live a successful Christian life if you don't focus on Christ. Our sin nature is so deep, is so perverse, so pervasive. If we lose focus on Christ, we are going to go off the rails. That's just, it is what it is. The Thessalonians focused on their Lord. They could face difficulties because their focus was on this hope in Christ. The church was steadfast. And the church was steadfast because, as we look at our last point, because of the Savior's faithfulness. 
verses 4 and 5, we see why Paul was thankful. We see why the church was steadfast. He says in verse 4, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. The reason we can live with the dedication of the, Th- of the Thessalonians is because God is faithful. He makes good promises and he keeps them. We can, we can follow the footsteps of the Thessalonians, trusting Christ because he makes good promises and he keeps his promises. First thing we see here is that he draws people to himself. He draws them. Paul uses the word brothers. He says, brothers loved by God. The Greek word is adelphos. Uh, um, the, way, the context it's used, it's, it's, it can mean male and female. Some translations actually say brothers and sisters, even though the Greek just says adelphos. But this is just family members. It's, it's not a specifically male thing. And I think, and I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I think it's important to recognize that in Scripture, men and women have differing roles. We, we see that. We're not going to argue that. But they have an equality before God. Even Peter talks about uh, husbands and wives, uh, tells, tells the husbands to, to be gracious to their wives because the wives are joint heirs with Christ. They're equals in Christ. Physically smaller, generally, Peter talks about uh, husbands treating their wives with respect because as the weaker vessel, and I think he's talking physically. Generally, women are, are physically smaller. Men can, can bully them and be, be physically violent. But in God's eyes, there's a, there's a spiritual equality. So he says, brothers, talking to all male and female believers. He, ta- he says, brothers loved by God. And this is, a, this is a, a fascinating expression. The root of this word loved is agape. And we've, t- we've studied this in the past. There's, there are several different Greek words that are translated love. Um, there's, there's phileo, which means like a brotherly love, a, a warm affection. It's a wonderful thing, a good thing. Um, but it means something different. Agape is, is the, the sacrificial love. It's a dedicated love that meets the needs of the object loved. I, I think there, there generally is an emotional component to it, but, but this is a love that's, that's a decision-based. If you think of like the marriage vows, um, a young man, young woman stand up to each other, and they promise to love one another. It wasn't sickness and health, rich or poor. I mean, I'd love to just take one or two of those. Like, yeah, I like the health and the richness. I'd like to avoid the others. But they promise. How do you promise? If, if love is warm, fuzzy feelings, you know, the, the, the warm affection, how can you promise? No matter how much you're, you know, how many butterflies are in your tummy, how can you promise that for 50 or 60 years you're going to have those butterflies in your tummy? I always joke when I started dating Aaron, I think I lost 25 pounds because I had the butterflies in my tummy. And I didn't, I just didn't eat around her. And I wasn't trying not to. I was just so excited that, you know, you know I, I married up. She was so far out. My, my buddy, when, when my, my, my close high school friend met her for the first time, when she walked, out the, she walked out of the room and he says, don't mess this up. She's so far out of your league. Just don't mess it up. So I took his, took his advice. But I just, I, I didn't eat very much. I lost like 25 pounds. And then at some point, the warm fuzzy, the, the, the butterflies kind of went away. I got a little more comfortable, and I gained it all back, you know. And it's a compliment of Aaron's cooking. That's what this is. But how can you promise that you're going to have the warm fuzzy feelings forever? You can't. So this love, this idea of this sacrificial love has to be more than just an emotion. It's a decision. I'm going to meet this person's needs. Now, is that, is that going to be easy? Within a marriage, the marriage vows, is that going to be easy? No. But you can, you can commit. And that's the picture here. Loved by God. This is a sacrificial love. This is a love of God. He's going to meet the needs of his people. He says, brothers, loved by God, he has chosen you. And that word chosen means picked out. The term ecclesia is what, where we get the word church. We, our, our word church is translated from ecclesia. It means the assembly or it means the called out ones. 
That's a big deal because we see God's sovereignty in this word. Certainly, sinners are told to repent and believe the gospel. There's a personal responsibility for trusting or rejecting Christ. The Bible teaches that clearly. But the Bible also teaches clearly that God is sovereign and he calls his people. The encouragement to this, talking about uh, um, believers having been chosen by God, the encouragement is that you have not accidentally become a Christian. You didn't stumble into the gospel. And I've known of people that, that were believers and they're, they wonder, they can never shake this feeling, does God really want me? I don't know, does God, am, I, am I really saved? Does God really want me? You didn't stumble into Christianity, God called you. You're here because God has opened your eyes. He changed your heart. If you have faith in Christ, it's because God gave you that faith and he's, he wants you. He's called you out of this lost world. And if you're hearing the gospel, it's because God is calling you to repentance, to salvation. There's no accidental salvations. Jesus says in John 15, he says, he's, he's talking to his 12 disciples, but it, it applies he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. He's talking to his disciples. He said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I came and got you. And I came and got you so that you should have a fruitful life. Maybe not rich and, and, and healthy like the prosperity gospel teachers teach, but God wants us to have a productive life, a fruitful life. Remember, the same God who called out Noah, and as you read through the Bible, you see this, this ongoing example of God calling people out. God called out Noah, told Noah to build a boat, right? No, nobody else is building the boat. Noah spends 100 years building a boat, probably being mocked. Have an idea that he was mocked because when the, when the boat is done, nobody else gets in it. Him and his wife, three boys and his daughter-in-law is getting the ark. No one else gets in the ark. God calls out Abraham, makes this beautiful unilateral promise to Abraham. I'm going to pick you, Abraham, and I'm going to bless the world through you. He called out David. David is a little, little shepherd boy. You know, he was killing some, he was killing some bears and some lions watching his sheep, but he's who's who's David? God calls him lifts him up to be king, and then promises that the ultimate king is going to come, he's going to be descended from you, and he's going to rule forever. The same God who did all that is still calling out his people today. And if you put your faith in Christ, it's because God has called you. And when he calls us out, our last point here today, is he powerfully transforms lives. He draws people to himself, but he doesn't draw people to leave them the way they were. One of the challenges, I think, in American Christianity is we have this, uh, you know, come as you are. And I have no problem with that. We, our doors are open. Come through these doors. Come as you are. But how wicked is it to tell people to leave as they were? Come in, and God won't change you. God's happy with you just the way you are. Really? Are you happy with you just the way you are? I know what I am in here. Thankfully, God calls us, and he transforms us. He says, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. So our gospel came to you. Gospel is good news. It's good tidings. You imagine, um, I was not alive for it, but when World War II ended, the, the, the kids that sold the newspaper on the, on, the, on the streets, they were calling out the good news that the war was over. The war's ended. The boys are coming home. Good news, the message that God offers to lost sinners salvation through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Jesus hung on the cross, shed his blood, took God's punishment for our sins. That's the good news. Through faith in Christ, you can take part. Our gospel came, Paul says, in power. Not in words only, not just in dead words, but in power. And that word is, uh, I think the Greek word behind it is dunamis. It's where you get dynamite. Uh, it, the word just means strength or ability. But the gospel has ability. The gospel has power. We think of Hebrews 4.12, where the word of God is alive and active. 
I mean, the Bible, we all have, we, we encourage you to bring a Bible. We encourage you to have a Bible. And honestly, on, on one sense, there's no magic to this. It's, well, this one's fake leather and paper and some ink, right? That's what it is. But man, the words in this book are powerful. They'll change your life. They'll cut into your life. They'll change you. This is why evil men and women have been trying for centuries, millennia, to hide or destroy it. How many world empires have tried to burn the Bible? You know, how many, how many conquerors have tried to outlaw Christianity? We think of the Roman Empire at the very beginning of the Christian experience. Um, the Roman Empire tries to stomp out Christianity. And what happens? Every time they stomp, the sparks of the gospel spread out. The church, most religions were spread by the sword. The, the early church was spread by men and women running from men with swords. The gospel has power. He says that it came in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. This word conviction means assurance or confidence. The gospel is trustworthy. It's unlike any religious message ever given. If you want to compare religions, there's only two. There's faith in Christ or faith in self. That is it. Pick a religion other than Christianity. You've got a system that you, if you follow this system, the deity will be, be fine with you. You've got the five pillars or the eightfold path or some other system. The gospel is different than any other religious message ever given. And it changes people's lives. There's power to it. Acts chapter 2 gives a good example of the gospel's power. Acts 2, beginning in verse 37. This is the end of the day of Pentecost. At the beginning of Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit descends on the apostles. They go out. Remember, these were guys that were hiding. They, they didn't know what to do after Christ died. They didn't know what to do even after Christ rose from the dead. They, they're, they're a mess. They're hiding together. The Holy Spirit falls on them, and they go out and they preach. The Holy Spirit miraculously works through them. They're speaking in foreign languages, but they're speaking with power. They're teaching the gospel with power. Verse 37 of Acts chapter 2. Now when they had heard this, this is the people listening to them, they were cut to the heart. And what had Peter said? Peter said, this Jesus whom you crucified is the only way of salvation. And Peter said to the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves in this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Peter, we know, we know some things about Peter. P, you know, Peter was, was many times quick to speak. He, he spoke before he, he you know, the, the, the tongue started before the, 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 the mind engaged sometimes. But after the resurrection of Christ, Peter doesn't know what to do. He's lost. Jesus takes him aside, Jesus restores him, but these guys are still lost. And when the, when the Holy Spirit falls on them, there's, a, a, there's an excitement, there's a strength, there's an energy to them. And as they preach the gospel, and it's not because Peter and the other apostles were somehow just brilliant orators, but the Holy Spirit's working, and the people who hear the gospel come to Christ. These formerly cowardly disciples boldly preached the gospel to some of the very people who called for Jesus to be crucified. And God used that gospel to bring 3,000 people to faith in Christ that day. That's the birth of the church. The church as we know it, people who have put their faith in Christ, these people were primarily, almost exclusively, Jewish people who, who put their faith in Christ as the Messiah, and that church spread. That's what God does. He changes lives. In Romans 6, 4, Paul says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Beyond being saved, there's certainly, I mean, you can't, can't under, undermine, uh, you, you can't uh, uh, diminish just being saved. I'm not going to go to hell. 
I've been saved from hell. But even more than that, God offers me a new life. He offers new life to those who trust in Jesus for salvation. And this is the God whom we can be thankful to, just as Paul was thankful. This is a God whom we can, we can steadfastly follow, just as the, as the Thessalonians followed. So in this passage, we've seen why the apostle was thankful. We've seen why the church was steadfast. It's because the Savior is faithful. So as we close, I'm going to ask Karen to come up to, to the piano. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up. And I'd like to give you a chance to speak with God. If you'd like to come up and pray, we have the, our prayer team is waiting for you. If you want to speak to God in your seat, that's fine as well. But I just want to give you a challenge. Christian, if you've put your faith in Christ, you know Christ is your Savior. Are you thankful? As, as Paul was thankful, recognizing every good gift comes from, comes from the Father. Are you thankful? Are you steadfastly following Christ? It's one thing to say, I follow Christ. It's, a very, it's another thing to actually follow Christ. If you love me, keep my commandments, Christ says. Are you following Christ? Are you obeying his commands in scriptures? Are you in the scripture enough to even know if you're obeying his commands? That's a challenge. Is your life being transformed through his word? Non-Christian, if you're here and you're not a believer, as we've talked about today, Jesus died to make the way for you to be saved, to be forgiven of your sin. Would you trust in him today? You can talk to him where you are. You can pray. There's no magic words. You can tell Jesus you recognize that you're a sinner, that you can't save yourself, and you're trusting him wholly for salvation. Or you can come up and, and have someone pray with you. But take a moment as the piano plays, speak with God. come before you. We thank you again for your word. We thank you for these observations, these, these lessons that we can learn from, from just these first few verses. As we saw Paul's thankfulness pointed to you, continuously pointed to you, I pray that you would challenge us to, to recognize what you've done that we should be thankful for. We thank you for the, the, the church's steadfastness, recognizing, knowing who their Lord was and, and enduring all the discomfort because they know you and they love you. I pray that we would be the same kind of people. We thank, we, we thank you, Lord, that, that you're faithful, that as we search the pages of your book, we can see your faithfulness. We see your promises and fulfilled promises over and over again. And I pray that we would trust you for the, the things you haven't fulfilled yet, the, the promises you haven't fulfilled yet. I pray that we would have a confidence that you are going to, and that we would look toward that. I pray, Lord, for anyone who has not trusted you as Savior, I pray that you would open their eyes and ears, draw them to yourself, change their lives, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.